medications to lower the stroke risk. So the consultation that we'll have for the next three days, folks will be able to sit down and you'll be able to go through all these things with them and step by step just guide them through what is the best for them. And then yes. they have the option of saying, okay, yes, because yes. you're not forcing anything on them. I need Correct. to get back to something here, but uh, of course, uh, hypertension, blood pressure and all that. Quite recently, there were studies that, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, that they're saying, well, the normal, you know, the reading that you normally get, uh, that the folks will say, well, if you're above that, it's bad. But now there was a recent study that has increased the numbers that are calling it normal. That's true. A lot has to do with the individual circumstances for each patient. And if you're otherwise healthy and have no medical issues of consequence throughout the rest of your body, then we are now accepting a little bit higher blood pressure than we used to in the past. If, however, you're a high-risk patient, then we might push that number that's acceptable lower. For example, if you were a diabetic, we're not going to accept a higher blood pressure that we would accept if you were not a diabetic. And so you have to individualize it for the patient rather than just the number itself. So when I teach my residents and my fellows and the medical students that I talked to earlier this week, the key point is treat the patient, not the organ system, not the lab test result, or not the blood pressure number, or not the x-ray result. Treat the patient as a whole and factor the entire picture into your management strategy. Because every individual is different. Absolutely. And the symptoms can be different also. Yeah. For every individual. As we look at, now how are you enjoying Antigua? I you? love it when I come down here. It's a gorgeous place. It's a gorgeous place. Now yeah. because uh, here you are, you're meeting folks and of course we want to make them uh, as well as possible and uh, you're in beautiful Antigua and Barbuda. So I guess that gives you a little extra step to make certain that you take care of us, huh? I would love and, to and keep us in a, in a, in a great men, uh, physical health and all that. Yeah, when I was down last time, I think we saw between 20, 24 patients or so, old. somewhere in that range, and I had a great visit. It was the entire spectrum of medical problems they came with from a heart standpoint. A number of them were just needing reassurance. A number of them had serious heart issues, and that I, as a consultant, was able to provide them an expert's opinion on what was going on. We had some people who needed to be referred for certain further steps in their care and other people that were given a diagnosis that clearly was erroneous from a previous evaluation and we were able to stop medications on some people because there was no indication that what their previous doctor had started them on was necessary or appropriate. So a second opinion is always a good thing. Always good. And it's not only a one-way street. I don't always provide the second opinion for people. I have several of my own patients mm -hmm. in my practice back in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. I had a lady about two weeks ago who had a serious problem. I recommended a management strategy for her. She said, I'm just not quite comfortable with this. Would you mind if I go up to the Mayo Clinic, for example, to have my case review there? I said, mm -hmm. of course. That's absolutely appropriate. And I actually contacted the physician at Mayo, represented that patient's data to that physician, and we were able to come to a consensus. And now with my openness to willingly accept mm. a second opinion on my primary opinion, the patient was much more comfortable that I wasn't just railroading them down a management strategy for my benefit or for my university's benefit, trying to get some procedure out of them without them being comfortable with what we were doing and why. So the fact that they can communicate with their Mayo Clinic second opinion, who validated my approach, everybody was comfortable with the process and the patient's gonna get their optimal medical care, which is of course what we're looking for in the first place. So folks who are just joining us, Ms. Consultation. Well, uh, any patient who believe that uh, his heart problem is not uh, controlled well enough with what he's taking. He can come and consult with us. And also I encourage, uh, I, uh, I encourage other doctors uh, to refer their patients because uh, I already have uh, several doctors who refer uh, a patient for consultation, direct consultation with Dr. Schwartz, mm -hmm. and the reports will go to these doctors directly. So patients who have chest pain, patients who have shortness of breath, patients who have swelling uh, uh, of the legs, um, fatigue, uh, fainting, and they are not satisfied with the medication they are on, they can come for a second opinion and Dr. Schwartz will see them and will make a decision regarding modifying their medication, maybe refer them for surgery or uh, uh, a second uh, opinion on their case. As we really, well, you had a, a lecturer at the AUA? 
I, I think I had eight lectures scheduled this yes, visit. Yes. So yes, Long. four yesterday. Four yesterday. Yes, sir. Well, what, what, what did you? What was the subject matter? Did I had the spectrum of students. So on uh, the island here, the medical students are in their preclinical years, so they're not yet seeing patients. They're doing the textbook learning that prepares them for seeing patients toward the latter part of their medical training. Mm -hmm. And I start with the basic cardiac pathophysiology, discussing issues such as heart failure, heart rhythm conditions, coronary artery disease hypertension, the whole spectrum of cardiovascular related problems, talking to them about whatever the biology that's going on, the pathophysiology that's going on to bring it out of the textbook. And uh, my mandate this time by the bosses was to put some patients cases into my lecture so that they can see that the textbook learning that they're doing actually applies to the real world and that there are walking people around there that have these conditions that need uh, management that relate to what they're already learning in the first two years of their medical school training. You, you mentioned, of course, diet, and I've heard it before with naturopathic, uh, they'll say, well, the doctors are not trained in, in uh, the, these sort of uh, uh, dietary things they should be using outside of the medication. Has that changed in today's medical school? Uh, I don't believe it has. So it's two questions. One is the dietary habits. Mm -hmm. uh, common sense goes a very long way. Mm -hmm. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian. Mm -hmm. If somebody has circumstances that warrant specialized training, mm -hmm. I'll refer them to a dietitian to, to get what I need. Mm -hmm. But common sense is usually enough to say, eat properly. If it so looks in the medical schools that we yes. have here, so they don't teach that in, 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 in outside, forget that as a medical doctor, you're doing uh, your, your studies. Is there anywhere along that line where they said, well, listen, they've been talking about, the naturopathic has been talking about all these positive things that yes. you can get from natural plants and herbs and all this. That is not a part of the studies. Well, in today's I, world? I would consider natural plants and herbs slightly separate from routine dietary habits. Mm -hmm. The herbal approach to thing is actually a very difficult issue for me as a cardiac specialist because if you go to the health food store, for example, and get some supplements off the, ch off the uh, shelf there, the problem with that is that the pharmaceuticals that we're able to prescribe for the appropriate patient, those are regulated by the FDA in the States. And I know that if you buy a 100 milligram pill of a certain drug, that it's got that drug at that dose. If you buy a nutraceutical supplement, take your choice of whatever you might want to do, and you buy it off the shelf from a health food store or a nutritional store, there's no guarantee of the dose being correct mm -hmm. if there's anything else in there and what else is going on. I had a patient about three months ago who was into heavy, heavy use of these nutraceutical agents because he was of the mindset that that was so healthy for him. He came in with severe heart failure because the consequences of whatever was in the medicine that he was taking. And so we essentially took a picture of all the medicines, showed him what he was taking, threw them all out. And fortunately for him, his heart did recover from the damage that was done by these agents. So I would take the supplements beyond the common sense very, very cautiously mm -hmm. and discuss with your physician. Some mm -hmm. of these supplemental agents are absolutely fine and probably do good for the heart. Mm -hmm. Some probably do not, and there's a misconception that they could be uh, helpful and they probably aren't in so reality. So you, you should always tell the medical physician what you're doing, what you're taking. Absolutely. And uh, when you go in for the consultation, be honest and be open and let them know all the things that you're using. Yeah, there was a professional baseball player for the Baltimore Orioles about three or four years ago right. when he yes, was taking picture, yeah. a um, supplemental agent from one of the health food stores and he dropped dead from a heart rhythm abnormality because of what was in that agent. Mm -hmm. And had he not taken it, he would be alive today for his family and for well, the consultation comes up today, tomorrow, and Friday. That's right. And uh, from 8.30 a.m.? To 5 p.m. To 5 p.m. The telephone numbers? 562-6932. Okay. Well, Dr. Schwartz, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Do come again. Likewise. Thank uh, you so much. Because, you know, it's not very often where we get a man of your specialty to take time out to visit us in Antigua and Barbuda. Here's hoping that the general public would utilize this occasion and get a chance to visit you. And, of course, Dr. Marcus, uh, we pleasure. want to say thanks to you for making this available to us in Antigua and Barbuda. And here's hoping the general public, who is in need of this clinical, of course, uh, uh, consultation will come and utilize the services. My pleasure. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Have a productive week. Take some time out. Spend some vacation with us when you go back to, of course, uh, where it is again? Oh, Missouri. Yes. Uh, is it cold down there? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. So there's reasons. And right before I came down, we had a tornado about two miles from my house. So, so he picked his time. So it's reasons for you to encourage them to come to uh, Antigua. Of course, yes. <laughs> All right, this tropical paradise, come That's again. Right. We're That's glad that you're here to take care of the inhabitants that lives right. here in Antigua and Barbuda. Here's hoping that your week will be successful and you stay in Antigua and Barbuda. will be a joyous one. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. Stay Thank with you. us, Dr. Marcus. You're going to be here all year long. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Thanks. It's good morning, Antigua and Barbuda. We'll be back with more.